one more time. <laughs> I'm a writer and speaker. I like to rethink how, to, how we think about work, especially when we look at organizational culture, but also to elevate the different types of virtual work challenges and opportunities that are taking place. This conference is such a great example of elevating what's happening out there, um, highlighting the kinds of uh, you know, unique opportunities and experiments that are running uh, in the world, but also what are some of the challenges and lessons that have come along the way? One of the other things that I get to do through this work is work for a company called Strategizer. We're a fully remote company across 12 countries. You might know us, we've, um, you know, our founders invented the business the value proposition canvas, uh, but also wrote the best-selling books, business model generation and value proposition design, among some others. The goal of Strategizer is to help companies uh, rethink the future and how they actually look at innovation through technology and more method methodical approaches. My job at Strategizer is really to drive the culture and in a nutshell, design how our culture functions, help our team do their best work, but also facilitate their growth and development. And just again, like I said, a, a few kind of stickies earlier, we're a fully remote company across 12 countries. And the challenges and opportunities that come with that really present uh, a lot of the thinking that comes through in what I'm gonna show you today. So what you're gonna find in this chat is why trust is such an important factor to successful remote work, uh, how we can spread a new narrative when talking to people who are now leading remote teams. So maybe if you are talking to management or leadership in startups or even in, in, in established companies about how we can change that narrative on trust, uh, but also how we can, we can spread a new narrative when talking to people, individuals who are working remotely for the first time. I think the observations and conversations that I've seen in the past six months are six, seven months are quite interesting, right? COVID really transformed uh, the concept of virtual working. These are things that I've been looking at and speaking on or reading about for maybe seven years. There are others in this space that have been doing it for 20 or 30 years. But from the kind of six to seven months, what we expected to happen in maybe the next 10 years took place in two weeks. COVID changed everything. Uh, from small businesses to massive enterprise organizations, we learned that trust is the emerging pattern of behavior between teams and their managers especially right now because we saw so many organizations transition to remote work because they had to, because of the health risk associated. So why is trust so important? What I have kind of distilled in the work that I do is that faith in your team means better autonomy and collaboration. Autonomy meaning your teams or individuals can self-organize or self-lead. Collaboration meaning they can do the best work with each other uh, without having the fear of knowing that you know, they might be kind of watched on or always looked upon or kind of micromanaged. We believe that at Strategizer, at least in the work that we're doing, that the team is able to do their best work without fear when the trust factor is there. Autonomy and collaboration is so important in those areas. So why is there a lack of trust? There are four kind of key areas that I've realized, not only in looking at the companies that we've kind of worked with, but also observing kind of the landscape of transition from working in an office to now having the choice of working remotely in more organizations. But the first one comes down to visibility. Uh, I'll see you when you get in. I can see you at your desk. The second one is also visibility. I'll see you at the meeting. Let's also set up a whole bunch of physical meetings to make sure that you're there and I can see you and we can have a conversation about what's happening, what's coming up next, etc. The third one is still visibility. Have you filled out your time tracker? Have you filled out your time sheet? When will I know you've clocked in and clocked down? Have you done your billable hours? There are some cultures that rely on that type of tracking in order to understand not only their business model, but how they effectively um, create value for their customers. And then the last one, of course, is visibility again. I'll see you when I leave. If you're the last one at your desk, uh, that means you've been working the hardest. That's a motorcycle going past my window if you heard that right now. <laughs> so again, one, two, three, four. Visibility is the key element here that becomes the issue of trust because so much depends on what we can see and monitor in our physical working environments. Now, that being said, although Strategizer and myself are remote first types of people, even virtual work environments fall into these traps. The difference here, however, is, and I think one of the things we're so proud and grateful about in the company that I work with is that we proactively assess the processes, rituals, and behaviors to iterate on them quickly. So we are no more immune than those companies that took the leap this year because they had to, or any more immune than the companies that have just started out even before COVID. We have to constantly assess and look at what we're doing to make sure that, you know, are we providing the, the utmost amount of trust in order, in order for the whole team to be collaborative 
but also to be able to do the work that they need to do to get done. So my whole idea is about changing the narrative and it's a big talk that I've been giving this year. And again, I'm grateful to the Agile Tour for giving me the opportunity to continue on this narrative about why trust is so important. I wanna change that narrative because I think remote work thrives on deliverability, what you produce and get done on a given day or week. It's not so much about being visible in the room, it's about what you shipped. Again, another common language in, in the developer world, in the uh, tech startup world. What did you get done? How are you moving the needle on what we need to achieve for our business mission, but also in the value that we want to create for our customers? But work also thrives on choice. So you're going to see now that some teams will prefer to work in physical locations while others want to be at home. The narrative here still comes down to providing options. It's always about providing the right amount or the best environment, sorry, for your teams to function in. If some of them want to choose to work and show up in a physical environment, if they can, based on health risks, like looking at the COVID uh, situation right now. But if someone to actually work at home because that's where they thrive, the more that enterprises and startups and businesses give people those options, uh, the more likely are they, that they are to be productive. I am already seeing in small businesses here um, or even medium-sized businesses in my country of Australia where they, you know, the leadership has just said, I don't want to deal with anyone working from home. I can't handle it. However, that doesn't necessarily work well for the entire team and what they're trying to achieve to together for the value they want to create. So there are some foundational rules that I'm going to start with um, that I think are still like big picture, very broad, but it's what we kind of understand and what I've seen in the work that I do uh, can be the base ground of how to actually provide that element of trust in the environment that you want to create virtually, but also physically. Because remember, one of the things that I'm going to point out throughout the rest of this presentation is everything that takes place in a virtual env environment can also take place in a physical environment. The difference is just the interfacing and the technology and the way we choose to work together. So let's talk about those foundational rules. The first one is completion. I mentioned earlier, deliverability is what is so important when it comes to virtual work environments. They should matter in physical ones too, but the foundational rule that you measure people on their output, what needs to get done, how much more uh, is there to go, but also having the honesty to say, what can't we achieve? And that it's okay to, to have that conversation. The second is communication. We don't always have to be in the same room to talk, but in a virtual work environment, being overly redundant is so important because you're talking through text. You might be th talking through um, you know, second languages, people who are bilingual, people who maybe English is not their first language, or maybe your company's first language is not English, but having that really foundational structure of how to communicate, when to communicate, and where to communicate is just so powerful to the understanding of what your team needs to know but also what your team might need clarity on. Time, time is the biggest one as well when you look at this. We need to respect where people live uh, and what their home life is like. We also need to acknowledge what time zones and, and, and how people respond to that. Right now for me, it's eight, it's almost nine o'clock in the evening here in Australia, which I think for everyone in Europe is uh, you know, the afternoon. And if there's anyone here from North America, it's the morning. Our days when we're working from home are also centered around our personal lives, right? We've got kids to take care of, take to school, we've got errands to do, life admin, all that stuff centers around what we do when we're working from home. It also matters in a physical work environment. The difference is that it's easier for us to get out and do those things because we have better access to it at home. Understanding how to fold that into the kind of working flexibility is so important but also knowing that some people don't want to be on a screen at 8.45 at night, except for certain reasons, right? How do we make those sacrifices and those balances to make it happen? And then lastly, iterate. I can't stress this enough as well. No process is perfect or set in stone. Even us as a remote first company, uh, for the past five years that I've been working with them, we are constantly iterating and revising and adjusting the process based on the feedback that we capture from the team and also the evidence that we learn from actually doing this work, but also from the lessons that we're seeing out in the field from all the countless other kind of organizations that are doing these experiments. We are constantly adjusting and trying to improve the process, sometimes even saying, hey, we failed here, let's not do that again. So I'm gonna unpack it a little bit further. I gave you kind of the foundational elements, but here's some things that I think have worked well for us. Uh, again, not to be dogmatic, meaning you don't have to do this, but I'm kind of just showing to you what has been helpful to us and we're constantly iterating on. Here's how we kind of engage the team. First of all, the trust factor has to start with leadership. If they don't set the stage and allow for honest conversations to happen, 
no one's going to be able to speak up and say, hey, you know, I would like to talk to you about the way we collaborate. I feel like I'm not getting enough space to do the work I need to do. My team does not feel like they have enough space to do the work we need to do because you don't seem to trust us. If leadership doesn't set that tone from the beginning and say, hey, let's open a conversation about how we can work better. How can we actually engage and for me to have peace of mind in this new environment, it's never going to happen. I also really encourage leadership, whether you're a team manager or your executive level of your organization, engage in as many one-to-ones as you can that is feasible for your schedule to connect with your team. Because it's how you're going to really kind of open up that trust factor. You, you know, it's one thing to kind of email, hey guys, I trust you all, let's get going. The more you connect on a one-to-one level with your team, you can actually understand what are the different pieces that make, uh, you know, make it happen. The second part is really having that culture ambassador, having a dedicated role for coordinating and facilitating conversations and engagement. That's actually the job that I do at Strategizer. It's my job to facilitate design meetings, figure out ways to get the pulse of the team (laughs) and help leadership and the actual teams do the work that they need to do while also talking to each other. The other thing that we do regularly is pulses. We do weekly, monthly, and even quarterly pulses to allow for open feedback. What this also allows us to do is create an anonymous uh, ability. Some people might not feel so comfortable. Excuse me, just gonna take a sip of water. Some people may not um, feel as comfortable being out in the open about the conversations they wanna have. So we create another channel for them to do so. This still allows for people to speak up, but in the, (coughs) excuse me, in the environment that makes most sense to them. Lastly, we have like a monthly all hands meeting. This is our kind of, One chance a month where all time zones across the board are together. It's a very, very uh, intensely designed meeting to, (coughs) sorry, this is such a thing to happen to me. I'm obviously gonna cough right in the middle of a presentation. Um, It allows us to encourage conversations on how to improve, but also make those commitments. What are we gonna do for the next 30 days to improve the way we collaborate, but also fix some of the things that have not been working in, you know, what we're doing in order to gain and to continue that trust. So a few tactical techniques, because I'm gonna drill down a bit more now and keep taking a sip of water. So the first section I talked about the broad foundational stuff, then I dug a bit deeper into what is a bit more kind of, I would say tactical, but this is now even more nitty gritty. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of asynchronous work. It's the idea that you don't necessarily have to be live in the room or meeting live in a session to do things. (coughs) <coughs> sorry <coughs> this is gonna look so good for my recording there'll be like a youtube supercut of me just coughing every few seconds uh from the agile tour presentation so i hope someone can edit that down for my linkedin um so the idea of asynchronous really is that people can't always be in the room with you even if it's a live even if that's a live room virtually we make an effort to record updates requests anything that we need to say to a team member but we also make an effort to record the meeting That being said, so that when you're actually in your time zone and working, you can actually spend just some time absorbing what was recorded and and getting a sense of what needs to happen and know what to do from there. For example, my team is awake right now, although I might be sleeping in a few hours, I'll wake up to a few recordings that I can absorb in the first kind of start to my day, know exactly what I need to do. The end of my day is usually the beginning of someone else's, so I'll leave some recordings for them and that allows them to know what to do. And they can actually see my face, they can see what I'm saying, It's not so much um, having to absorb just text. It also makes it so easy to just record free flowing consciousness kind of videos at a time because then you're not sitting there trying to figure out what to type out and all that kind of stuff. The great thing about some of the software that's out there is they limit you at how long you can record uh, a video for someone. So in some cases, for example, Loom, which is quite a popular one, they limit it to five minutes. So you really have to get good at knowing what you're gonna say. The second part is a daily huddle ritual. Something that we do here at Strategizer is on Slack, we've created a ritual where every day people just list out what they're doing. Um, And we can see on any given day what anyone's working on. Why this is helpful, not only from a productivity standpoint is as a leader, you can see what your team is working on. You can also tag people and say, hey, I noticed you're dealing with this today. Do you wanna chat? Can I record a video for you? Are there any questions you have? Would you like to schedule something further on down the road so we can connect on it? The other element is also works as a great checklist. Uh, Most of our team goes back through their daily huddle and will check off all the things they got through and the things they didn't get through. 
Notification mutes are so powerful. I can tell you right now by 5 30, 6 o'clock, <coughs> I do not allow any notifications to come through uh, on my phone until about 7 or 8 a.m. the next day. We set rules for them so that people aren't, uh, you know, buzzed at times, especially during specific hours. If you've got certain team members that take time off to go be with their families or they go volunteer or do other types of activities outside or during the day of the working time, being able to set those rules and stagger them just allows a bit of peace of mind. It means that you don't have to be constantly checking your phone when you're away from the computer, away from the laptop and away from your phone. Lastly is the calendar. I know calendars might seem so basic, but, and I imagine in the audience today, there are some huge calendar wizards. We always make sure <laughs> when people are away, what their downtime is like. Clearly marking out what the time is uh, when you're there and when you're not there is just so helpful for booking any live meetings, booking any kind of coordination stuff that you need to do. Uh, our team, our team ops admin team, which is the team that manages the calendar and manages and make sure that everyone has put their kind of availability in is so strict with us and is so helpful so that we're not again, kind of overlapping on anyone or you know, uh, ruining someone's time when they've blocked out other types of thing, things. So the calendar is just so important. I think the biggest thing that I can share at the end of the day is um, one of the things I also mentioned was, you know, it's so iterative, the process needs to be adjusted constantly. If you can dedicate a channel or a space uh, for your team to share any lessons learned, either from you as a team yourself or what you're seeing out in the field and online, but just to see what progress you're making and to see how that stacks up against what other types of experiments are going on, it allows you to iterate more quickly and adjust what it is that you're doing because Again, this is, I won't say it's so new, it's just the way that we're doing it now is constantly creating new types of evidence for us to learn from. It's also showing good failure. It's showing in the ways in which, you know, you know, you don't wanna make certain mistakes or how you can avoid certain mistakes that could be costly to your team. But by opening the space, you're also in inviting a number of your team members to create that trust factor of, hey, this company just did this, or this talk did this, or hey, our, actually, our team did a sprint where we tried to see where we didn't do any live meetings for a month, here's what we learned. And it continues to build that trust factor because you're kind of working together to collaborate and contribute to the way your organization is gonna run. So I'm gonna kind of end it with the big kind of key points of what I like to remember for myself and for the team that I work with, but also hopefully that this has been helpful to you. Not all working cultures are gonna be the same. I totally understand that, but adjust to what works for you and trial and experiment before going all in. If you can pilot something with a few different teams rather than uh, amassing it across the team and then having a huge amount of failure, the more you can experiment in small ways with a team, uh, you know, the better you're gonna be. That's at least one thing I know has been consistent across any size organization. Leadership buy-in is gonna be so incredibly important and it sets the tone for how people work. If your leadership or if you are a leader, if you're just saying that you trust them, but not really following through on it, it's just, it's just not going to work. It's going to be a lot of theater when you really want to show to people that this is something you can do. Roll your sleeves up, get involved, because you're also going to be working in these styles as well. Um, three, allow people to speak up without getting in trouble. I know that these are going to be difficult conversations, but if you can make them constructive conversations, you're really going to build that trust factor. I can tell you right now, even in our company calls every month, it's still difficult for some people to speak up and really just be honest about what they're facing. It may not be about professional stuff. It could be about something going on in their home life that is affecting the way that they work virtually. We're constantly finding ways to kind of open up that conversation. Again, leadership coming up and saying, let me share something that's been difficult. Would you like to share something? You're not gonna get in trouble for it. Let's open the floor and be honest with each other so we can actually help each other out. In addition, like I mentioned earlier, we've got other ways and other channels for people to provide that information anonymously if they don't feel comfortable coming up uh, and saying it in a public forum. We also wanna make sure that they're constructive, right? Emotions are gonna be tight. Uh, conflict is so normal because we are humans, especially when we're trying to collaborate and work on a mission together. There are gonna be things that we do well and some, some things that we don't do well, and that's gonna create tension. But the more that you can facilitate a conversation between team members, individuals, and leadership to have that conversation, the more powerful you're all going to be from it. And lastly, I know I've said it a few times, iterate, iterate, iterate. Nothing is set in stone. You can always improve it. You can always make it better. You can always stop before you know you're going to fail really bad. 
um, and, and save yourself the six, you know, sorry, the save yourself the, the intense risk that you might face. Because at the end of the day, knowing when to stop is still success. So that's kind of my, my quick uh, rundown of it. I hope it was helpful to you. And uh, I believe, is there time for questions or is it? Yeah, is Kari, we, want, we have one question on, on the Q&A session. If you have access, you can read it yourself. Or if, if it's more convenient for you, I can read the question for you. Uh, I would love it if you could read it for me. Please. Yeah, sure. So how you conduct all hands for all time zones, or I guess it's not all around the world then. So we, we do make a ritual of saying, this is the one time a month where everyone meets. We all make a sacrifice to do that meeting. It's an hour and a half um, every month. And all of us from all 12 countries come together. Uh, for some of our team members, it's okay because the bulk of the team is in Europe and North America. But for those of us in Australia, it's generally late evening, early morning for some of us. Uh, one of the things we do make clear though is, you know, for some people who are in very, very far out time zones, like two, three in the morning, we'll record the meeting for them. They can catch up on it on the next day. And there's, if there's any inputs they need to make, we give them the spaces to do that as well. Just to give you another example, um, one of the big things about our culture, and I'm sure for a lot of companies, is an offsite. The kind of team building get together that people would do maybe once or twice a year. Strategizer really prides itself on the offsite that we do every year, but because of COVID, we can't meet up in a physical location. So next week, we're actually doing our virtual offsite. It's gonna be five days straight of virtual sessions where we're working on kind of the hardest problems we need to solve in the room for our company and our culture in one week. It's gonna be a big sacrifice for a lot of us uh, doing four hours a day from, I think for me, it's gonna be 2 a.m. to uh, 6 a.m. every day. Well, for other people, it's gonna be other times of the day as well. But we commit at least once a year to do that in this situation and of course once a month for the company call to all be there and, and kind of facilitate and participate together gotcha yeah i think the, rec the, rec the recording is a is a usual practice when we have a, a fully global company across uh, where the time zones span across the globe uh, another efficiency is that when you watch a recording you can actually watch it a bit faster than the usual mm. pace so you can mm -hmm. actually shrink a little bit the time you need to dedicate uh, for for that particular meeting um yeah I, really, I, I just wanted to add to that it really forces the team to think a bit harder especially because they're being verbal about what they're saying and why um, but I think it gives people a few more chances to do it because you can spend so much time sitting down and writing. And if for some people, you know, just texting things out is not their strong suit, but they can speak more clearly, having that option just makes such a difference uh, and saves so much time out of the day. Yeah. Um, as we have a little bit more time, um, I just wanted to also reflect a little bit on, on what you presented today. I think the content itself is really great. I also work in a company that is fully remote. We have we are 700 people uh, fully remote, not, not even a single office across the globe. Uh, I, I'm with the company for one year. So uh, I think that, that what you mentioned about communication is super important that people understand when they are when they get remote, they have to over communicate. They don't have to think that over communication is something wrong. Indeed, yeah. that's exactly what everyone needs to do because that over communication, uh, people tend to choose properly whether, whether to read your messages or not, but you have to give them that choice. As yeah. an opposite, you sometimes assume, ah, maybe I should not really do that much of communication, but yeah. uh, usually that, uh, that doesn't add uh, that trust that you are talking yeah. about here. So, so true. I, I, I definitely with the team notice, you know, there's some that say, well, I don't know who's reading it, so what's the point? Yeah. Or I said it and nobody saw it. And so we always, always encourage repetition, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you work in an environment and you're using tools like Slack, where there's so much information coming through the feed, you're going to miss a lot of things. You might remind yourself to watch something later, but we really encourage team members to kind of repeat it again, point them to it again, say it again. One of the rituals we do in every meeting, uh, even if we're live or even on a video uh, recording is just, again, re-communicate why we're here, what we're doing, and what it does is not only remind people if they forgot, or maybe it's new news for them, but it gets makes us better at communicating things really clearly and very succinctly. 
Another thing that I really liked what you said is um, to really pay attention more to the outcomes or you said outputs, I guess, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, instead of really paying attention to the office hours that people are spending in, um, they check in, they check out at the end of the day. And I, I recall instantly uh, one really um, great author, uh, an author of Theory of Constraints, Dr. Eliyahu. He said, tell me how you're going to measure me and I'll tell you how I'm going to behave. Yeah. Wow. So you see, if you measure people um, around their check-in and check-out times, this is exactly how they're going to focus. This is where they're going to put their focus on. Now, if you measure them on the outputs or the outcomes, preferably, this yeah. is where they yeah. spend their energy. Yeah, yeah, well, that's so true. I still find in our um, in our collaboration with our team, like that changes from project to project and it'll change on the complexity of it. If we're working on something that we know how to do really well, that trust factor is already gonna be built in. We know who to trust, we know what needs to be done. But oftentimes in many companies, right? You're, you're doing new things. You might be exploring new areas and some people might feel uncomfortable. They, maybe they wanna just manage the risk element of it um, in, uh, ahead of things. You know, they've got heaps of questions. And so you have to rework what the trust situation looks like um, to make it happen. And it, directly to what you just said in the quote there, you know, on how you'll behave based on how you're gonna measure me, yeah. Yeah, and connected to that, a question to you, Kavi. Um, in, a, in a virtual environment, I'm not saying it's also easy to do in a physical environment where, we, where, where teams are collocated. I mean, it's a general, um, it's a generic challenge However, how do we make sure that those goals, um, objectives, key results, if, if companies are using them, of course, how do we make, we make sure that those are perceived properly, understood properly, and they are actually always in front of us uh, yeah. throughout the quarter, throughout the annual period? Yeah. Really good question. One that um, we you know, continue to work on, and it comes back to the repetition. Um, every meeting, every, every all hands meeting that we do, refocus the priorities again, what we're working towards. Every um, video update that comes from leadership, if it's the founders or our COO, reframe the priorities again. Um, if we're going to be meeting for something or a team is collaborating live on something, again, rewatch the videos that the founders have put up on what the priorities are, where we're heading. And then, of course, we've got the different check ins that the teams will do on their own <clears throat> on understanding if they're hitting their OKRs or their KPIs and things like that. Again, every meeting starts with that ritual. What are we working towards? Now let's talk about how we're doing and what do we need to get there or have we accomplished it? The repetition, I know sometimes it can be so tiring, but it, I guess for the person who's doing the repeating, it can be tiring, but I guarantee you for the person who's absorbing that information is probably so helpful. But we, every single thing we do starts with the priorities over and over and over again. Yeah. I don't really remember. I think it's re repetition uh, is mentioned in so many books that I don't even recall which book was it <laughs> where I read about it. I think it was multiple books where everyone says, repeat, repeat the message, repeat the message, mm. because that mm. brings people to the alignment and alignment mm. brings, brings companies to the success. Well, I'll give you an example. In the presentation, I mentioned the daily huddle ritual. And for those who are more, I think, in more startup centric, you know, from what I understand, that's where the huddle technique comes from, right? In Slack or whatever, it's a status update. You're posting what you're working on. Mm. We had a team member who started that ritual probably four years ago. And I can tell you, this was before you could do the reminder feature, I think, in Slack. I think he would, he would manually remind people every day, don't forget to fill out your huddle not only publicly, he would direct message you. And that's how we actually over, I think a year or so, got to the point where it's now just a reflex of ours. And you can tell, you know, even with certain new team members, when we onboard them, that, that kind of get into that habit. You need to let people know what you're doing. It's just a quick update. And it also helps you frame your day of what you're gonna be working on. But without that repetition and that um, perseverance from our team member, that probably wouldn't have been a ritual of ours. Mm. From my personal experience, I have two things to share. Um, I, I think everyone saw pretty frequently on, on, on social media phrases like, 
oh, now when I'm fully remote or not necessarily fully remote, but now in a remote environment, I understood that um, this, me me this meeting could have been an email. Um, yep. I have two things on that. So first, um, I think in TopTal, the company I work for now, I send 10 emails in a year. So mm. it, for me, that sounds like <laughs> this meeting could have been a Slack message yeah. or even, even more dramatically or drastically. Uh, yeah. a, a meeting that could have been just a recording, right? And, and yeah. you really move asynchronously so that people watch the recording whenever they are available. Because if you just want to inform and, and you don't really require a, a I don't know, bi-directional communication and a feedback yeah. instantly, make a recording to make people, allow people to, to choose when they yeah. want to see that recording. Yeah, yeah, no, I could not agree more. It's probably the thing I spend most of my time doing now is making recordings and it saves, I honestly prefer, again, right? It comes down to preference, but we still, you know, we still have team members that'll kind of ping and say, hey, can I just bug you right now? And at least we have the option to say, you know what, not right now, but can you make me a recording? And I can get back to you on that. And so I think having that flexibility is important, right? Because I'm personally, for me, I'm someone that can't do heaps of live meetings. Um, I need to have focus time, whereas other people are much better in live collaboration meeting sessions. So we really do create that structure to say, you know what, I can't meet right now, let's do a recording. <laughs> and I mean, I've got team members that I'll make a recording for, but they'll reply in text and it still works. But right, it's finding that balance um, to not have to just waste time because meetings are hard. I will, that's, you know, they're useful, but they're very hard. And expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we don't have any other questions online, at least. Um, Kavi, thanks a lot. Uh, it was really great to have you here, uh, you sharing your experience. Uh, I think a lot of people heard a lot of good ideas from you. Um, so, so thanks a lot for that.